Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is David A., and I'm an alcoholic. And only because of God's grace through the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have not found it necessary to, nor have I taken a drink of an alcoholic nerd since April the 20th, 1967, and for this I am so thankful. And my home group is the Preston Group in Dallas, Texas. It's a huge AA group. And um, you hear a lot of times in AA, if you do not think your group is the best group, and they, they go get you another one. Well, I don't believe that. I believe I don't believe you need to leave your group and mess up somebody else's group. <laughs> I'm a firm believer that if you don't do not believe your group is the best group in Alcoholics Anonymous, you stay there and help make it the best. My role this afternoon will be to share AA's experience in the writing of a book, which has turned out to be one of the most successful books that the world has known other than the big, big book. There's no no matter how many millions of copies that we have today, but at first it was not so, because the talking about a book first started in the living room of Bob and Ann Smith in Akron. Bill had landed in Akron in the summer of, ni- of, of 1935, and a little group caught hold, Bill helped Dr. Bob briefly with it, and Dr. Bob and he went on to found what we called in AA the first AA group in the world. Now, at that time, it was not known as Alcoholics Anonymous. The group was just simply an anonymous bunch of drunks trying to help each other. And as it was with new groups, it was nearly always failure, but now and then somebody would see the light, and there was progress. Bill then went back to New York City with a little experience, and a group started in New York called the Manhattan Group. And by the time 1937 rolled around, AA had spread into Cleveland and began to move south and north from New York City, but it was still in those years more or less flying blind, a flickering candle indeed, that at any moment could be snuffed out. On a late fall afternoon in 1937 in Akron, Dr. Bob and Bill were talking together in Dr. Bob's living room, and they began to count sober noses. How many had stayed dry in Akron and in New York, and maybe a few in Cleveland? How many had stayed dry and for how long? And when all of this was totaled up, sure, it was just a handful, 35 or 40, maybe. But enough time had elapsed on enough really fatal cases of alcoholism so that when Bill and Bob grasped the impact of those small statistics, Bill and Bob saw, really, for the first time, that this thing had a wonderful opportunity to succeed, that God in His providence and mercy had thrown a new light in the dark tunnels and caves where our kind have been, and believe it or not, by the millions still living today. Even with AA's tremendous public information procedures, with all of our television spots and radio spots and newspapers and other articles that appear everywhere, there are millions who still do not know. And I'm one of these, and they believe that the AA message ought to be that every alcoholic who's drinking alcohol right this second needs to hear the AA message at least once. Now, that'll keep us busy, I don't mind telling you. And so, as a result of it, that even though there were a couple of score of sober members, it had taken three long years. Sure, there was a lot of failures, but still it had taken three years to sober up only a handful. 
Now, Bill and Bob began to ponder, how could this handful carry its message to all of those who still did not know? After all, not all of the drunks in the world could come to Akron or to New York City. So how could they transmit the message to them and by what means? Bill and Bob thought that maybe they should go to the old-timers. Well, in those days, everybody was an old-timer. A new one would come in, and he'd be sober three days, and another new one come in. The one sober three days would be the new one's sponsor. Then the sponsor would get drunk, and the new one would be the, his sponsor's sponsor once again. <laughs> and so as a result, and then they said, find some money. Now, somebody else's money. And say to them, now take a year off your job if you have one. Most of them didn't have a job. And go to all parts of this country and during that year and get groups started. Now, hospitals in those days were not too happy with drunks because they'd sneak them in and they'd put them in under what they call stomach trouble and everything else. And the drunks in that short kimono and they'd set fire to the bed with cigarettes. They'd drink the rubbing alcohol. They'd wander down the room in them paper shoes doing that Thorazine shuffle, you know, hollering, hey, nurse. And it was hard on the heart patients and they didn't want the drunks in the hospital. So it being obvious that drunks were unloving creatures, then they decided, well, they needed to have a chain of hospitals, sort of like chain drug stores, chain grocery stores, chain department stores, because you have to remember those who are old enough that they were coming off of the Depression in 1932, and the only businesses that were making money were the chain businesses, and they were the only ones. So why not have a chain of drunk tanks, and then they could really make the money? So they decided then they're going to have to have some missionaries, subsidized, of course, by a chain of drunk talk tanks. Now, being, Bill, being the Wall Street promoter, was far more insistent about these things than Dr. Bob. And after all, it would take a lot of money to finance all this. And after all, with all this brand new light shining in the dark world, they would just squirt it in the eyes of the rich and they would kick in with the money. And they also reflected that they had to get some sort of a standard literature or some sort of a book. And because uh, up to this moment, not a syllable, not a single word, of this program was in writing. It was a sort of word, word or mouth deal with variations according to each man or woman's fancy. In a general way, this was the pitch. Booze has got you down. You've got an allergy and an obsession, and you're hopeless. If you are, then you better get honest with yourself. Take stock. You ought to talk this out with somebody. You ought to make restitution for the harms you did, and you ought to make amends, and you prayed the best you could according to your belief, if you had any belief. And that was the sum of the Word of the Mouth program up to that time. Now, variations of that was already appearing. So they began to reflect, how could we unify this thing? Could they, out of their experience, get certain principles, describe certain methods, that had done the job for them. So it became obvious that if this movement was to have to propagate, it had to have literature. So its message could not be garbled either by the drunks or the general public. And believe it or not, today, all over the world, the greatest challenge that we have within Alcoholics Anonymous right this very second, that our message is being garbled by unknown so-called members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's very confusing to the public. And many groups are beginning to feel the effects of it. Why is it we're getting a lot of people who never even drank alcohol that want to be members of Alcoholics Anonymous? And that is because of the unknowing fact of many members of our Alcoholics Anonymous all over the world. So they needed to have missionaries, a chain of drunk tanks, and a book. And even at that early date, both Bill and Bob began to learn that they were not the government of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bob, perhaps more than Bill, already realized that the conscience of the group, the opinion of the group, when it was an informed opinion, but more important, in the group's best interest, it could be better than both Dr. Bob and Bill. So they thought it would be better to consult people. Now, there was a non-alcoholic by the name of T. Henry Williams 
and his wife, they let the Akron bunch meet in their homes. So a meeting was called in the Akron group, and that is those who had been sober any length of time. They managed to scrape up about 18. Bill and Bob told them that they were within sight of success, that they thought that this deal would go on and on and on, that a new light was shining in their dark world, but how could this light be transmitted without being distorted and garbled? At this point, the meeting was turned over to Bill, and Bill, being a salesman and a Wall Street stock promoter, he set right to work on the, about the drunk tanks and, and subsidies for missionaries, and they touched a little on maybe a book, and their group conscience, which consisted of 18 men, were darn skeptical about it all. Almost with one voice, they screamed out, Let's keep it simple. This is going to bring money into this thing. This is going to create a professional class, and we'll all be ruined. Bill countered by admitting, yeah, that their arguments had merit, but he also reminded them that alcoholics were dying like flies, and how could they carry the message to others? He reminded them that they had to take some kind of chances. He said, we cannot keep it so simple that it becomes an anarchy and thus gets complicated. We cannot keep it so simple that it will not propagate itself, and that we have to have a lot of money to do these things. And after Bill had exerted his conning to his utmost, they finally got a vote in that meeting, and a close vote at that, by just a majority of two or three. The meeting then said to Bill, with some reluctance, well, if we need a lot of money, you better go to back to New York where there's plenty of it, and you raise it. Well, that's exactly what Bill wanted to hear, just what he had been waiting for. So he scrammed back to New York City, and he began to approach some people with money and to describe this tremendous thing that had happened. But it didn't seem so tremendous to people with a lot of money at all. Why, they said. Thirty-five or forty drunks sobered up, They've sobered them up before, and now you know, besides Mr. Wilson, they told him, don't you think that is kind of sweeping up the crumbs? Wouldn't something for the Red Cross or the Salvation Army or for church missionaries be better? And with all of Bill's cunning, he got one heck of a freeze from the gentleman of money. Now, things were rough in New York City. They were starving to death on Clinton Street. Drunks were eating the Wilsons out of house and home. For in those days, they never charged anybody for anything. And Lois, Bill's wife, was earning the money working in an apartment store while Bill was being a missionary, and the drunks were eating all the meals. And this couldn't go on. Bill kept plugging away to get them darn drunk tanks, and plugging away, we've got to have those missionaries, and we've got to have a book. One morning, Bill called on his brother-in-law, a physician by the name of Dr. Leonard Strong. And he started to bellyache about how those rich guys wouldn't give him any money. This great and glorious enterprise that was well on its way. It seemed, however, that Dr. Strong, when he was in high school, he dated a girl. And this girl had an uncle, and he met his uncle. And he believed that he was tied up with the Rockefeller family and their charity. And he asked Bill, well, if he wanted to, would they like to call up the Rockefeller offices and see if there still was such a man? And if there is, is he alive? And will he see us? Well, Bill hadn't tried the Rockefeller offices yet, so they give, they agreed to give him a ring. Oh, on what slender threads our destiny sometimes hang. Remember, Bill's brother-in-law said, I dated a girl. And I met, and I think she had an uncle, so the call was made. And the voice came on the telephone, the voice of Mr. Willard Richardson, one of the loveliest gentlemen that Bill and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous was ever to know. And the moment he recognized Bill's brother-in-law, uh, Bill's uh, brother-in-law, he said, Why, Leonard, where have you been all these years? And after a few exchanges, Dr. Strong explained to Mr. Richardson that he had a brother-in-law who was having success in sobering up drunks, and could the two of them come over and see him? 
Sure, said Mr. Richardson, come right over. So they went over to the Rockefeller Plaza and right into John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s personal offices, and they asked to see Mr. Richardson. After meeting with Mr. Richardson, Bill sat down and told him about their exciting discovery, this terrific cure for alcoholism that they had just hit the world, how it works, and what they had done. And this was the first receptive man or with money or access to money, and he was above all at that time perhaps Mr. John D. Rockefeller's best personal friend, and he not only was his best personal friend, he was also John Jr.'s spiritual advisor. So he said, why, yes, he was very interested. Then he asked Bill to have lunch with him, and for a rising promoter, Bill thought things were looking up. During lunch, they would go over the deal again. And after lunch, he asked Bill if he would like to have a larger meeting with some of Mr. Rockefeller's and Mr. Richardson's friends. He said there will be Mr. Frank Amos. He's head of one of the largest advertising businesses in the world. And he was on the committee that recommended John D. Rockefeller Jr. to drop this prohibition business that he got into. Then there'll be Mr. Leroy Chipman. He looks after all of the Rockefeller family's real estate. And there's Mr. Scott, chairman of the board of the Riverside Church, and a number of people like that that he believed they would like to hear Bill's story. And so on a winter's night, a meeting was held in late 1937, the first weekend in December of 37, and called in post-haste for this meeting, a couple of drunks and Dr. Bob from Akron. Bill came in with a New York bunch, four or five. The meeting was held in Mr. John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s personal boardroom, and Bill really got excited when he was told that he was sitting in a chair just vacated by Mr. Rockefeller, and Bill could feel that money just coming right into his hip pocket, you know. Dr. Silkworth was also there, and he testified what he had seen happen. And each drunk, thinking of nothing better to say, each told their story of drinking and their recovery, and that is where our recovery stories, the manner in which we still do it today, what it used to be like, what happened, and how it is at the time we tell it. It's still the most powerful element in Alcoholics Anonymous. And after seeing that these good new friends were interested, Bill started putting the big touch by bringing up the subject of drunk tanks, of subsidized missionaries, and this question of a book or literature. Well, God moves in mysterious ways and is wonders to perform, but it certainly did not look like a wonder to Bill when Mr. Scott head of a large engineering firm, chairman of the Riverside Church, looked at this bunch of drunks and said, but gentlemen, up to this point, this has been the work of goodwill only. No buildings, no property, no paid people, just one carrying the good news to the next. Is that not true? And here he dropped his bombshell. And may it not be that that is where the great power of this society lies, and how true that turned out to be. Now, he said, if we subsidize this, why we, might we not alter its whole character? We want to do all we can. We are gathered here for that. But would it be wise? Then all the drunks gave Mr. Scott the rush and said, there are only 40 of us, and it's taken three years for 40 to get sober. Why, millions will rot before this thing gets to them, unless we have money and a lot of it. So one of the businessmen volunteered to investigate them very carefully. And since poor old Dr. Bob was harder up at that time than Bill, and since the first AA group was in a typical community situation in Akron, the drunks directed their that man's attention out there. And Frank Amos who later became a trustee on the old Alcoholic Foundation, the Alcoholic Association, which we now know as the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous, at his own expense went out to Akron, made all the inquiries about Dr. Bob. All the reports were good, except that he was a drunk who recently had gotten over it. He visited the little meeting out there. He went to the Smith's home, and he came back with what he thought was a very modest, uh, modest project. And he recommended 
that they could recommend a token amount of money at first. Now, for them, the rich people, is a token amount of money, $50,000. And that would clear off the mortgage on the Smith home, would get the drunks in Akron a little rehabilitation place, put Dr. Bob in charge, subsidize a few of these people, start a chain of hospitals and a few missionaries, and maybe get busy on the book. However, Mr. Richardson took that report into John D. Jr., who read the report and told Mr. Richardson, somehow I'm strangely stirred by all this. This interests me immensely. And then he dropped his bombshell. But isn't money going to spoil this thing? I'm terribly afraid that it would. And yet, I'm so strangely stirred about it. The next turning point came in our destiny when that man whose business was giving away money said to Mr. Willard Richardson, No, I will not be the one to spoil this thing with money. You say these men who are heading it are strapped for cash. I'll put $5,000 in the Riverside Church Treasury. You folks can form yourself into a committee and draw on it as you like, but please do not ask me for any more. But I want to hear what goes on. Well, the 50000 had shrunk now to 5000 The drunks paid the mortgage on Dr. Bob's house. That was about 3000 That left 2000 and Bill and Dr. Bob started eating away on that. And what would they do now? You notice none of the drunks that were sober ever thought about going to work and making some money. They were hustling everybody else. And, uh, well, they had more meetings with their new found friends, Amos, Richardson, Scott, Chipman, and those fellas who stuck with the drunks from then on. And in spite of Mr. Rockefeller's advice, the drunks again con tried to con again convince their new friends that this thing needed a lot of money. So one of them proposed that they form a foundation, something like the alcoholic found, uh, like the Rockefeller Foundation, rather. And then one of them got a free lawyer from Ellie Hoot's firm, which at that time was one of the largest law firms in the world, who was interested in this thing. And they, uh, the drunks asked him to draw up an agreement of trust or a charter for something to be called the Alcoholic Foundation. Now, why they picked that name? Even Bill didn't know. They didn't know if the foundation was alcoholic or whether they had alcoholic in the foundation. The lawyer, however, was very much confused because in the meeting in which the foundation was formed, the drunks made it very, very plain that the drunks did not wish to be in a majority. They felt that there should be non-alcoholics on the board and that they ought to be in a majority of one. Now, the drunks were no fools. The reason that they wanted a majority of non-alcoholics is so if all the alcoholics on the board got drunk, they would still have a quorum to have a board meeting. Sure, said the lawyer, but what's the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic? And there's always a smart drunk running around, and one of the drunks says, well, that's a cent. A non-alcoholic is a guy who can drink, and an alcoholic is a guy who can't drink. Well, said the lawyer. How do you state that legally? And no one knew. Now, if you'd like to know how it's stated legally, if you read one of the most dangerous pieces of literature in AA called the Service Manual, where they talk about rotation. See, there are three things take care of all the problems in AA. Alcohol, death, and rotation. It does the best job. And so it's, if you read the bylaws of the General Service Board, it talks about Class A trustees, non-alcoholic, and those who can safely partake the use of alcoholic beverages, and those who cannot Class B alcoholic. So, it, and that's how it's stated legally. So, at length, they had a foundation and a board which consisted of about seven, consisting of four of their new non-alcoholic friends and some of the drunks. Now, Dr. Bob went on the board, but Bill sort of caught his state off saying it would be more uh, convenient to work behind the scenes. So with this new foundation farm, with the idea of needing a lot of money, the drunk started again to solicit money again from the very rich. Now, they managed to get a hold of some of John D. Rockefeller's friends and some of the credentials, and they embellished it quite a bit and added to it. And so they started calling on personally and writing them letters, and uh, they said, how could they miss? They asked themselves, the foundation had been formed in the spring of 1938, and all summer 
they solicited the rich. Well, the rich were either in Florida or they were in Africa or they were in Canada or they were on vacation or in Hawaii. And many of them preferred the Red Cross and the Salvation Army or their church missionaries. And some thought that the drunks were too disgusting and they didn't get one darn cent in the whole summer of 1938. Thank God. In the meantime, they began to hold trustee meetings. And really, they were commiseration meetings on getting no dough. And what with the mortgage and bill and Dr. Bob eating away at it, the five grand had was gone, and they're all busted again. And Dr. Smith had trouble getting his practice back because patients were a little leery about being carved up by an alcoholic surgeon, even if he was three years sober. And things were tough all around. Well, what would they do? So one day in August 1938, Bill produced at a foundation meeting a couple of chapters of the proposed book in rough and in mimeograph. As a matter of fact, they've been using those two chapters of this proposed book, along with some recommendations from physicians down at Johns Hopkins Medical Center to try to put the bite on the rich. Then Frank Amos said, I know the religious editors down there at Harper's. Why don't you take these two book chapters down to Harper's to Mr. Gene Axman, your story, and the introduction to the book, and see what he thinks about them. And to Bill's surprise, Mr. Axman, who became later a tremendous friend of ours, looked at the chapters and asked Bill if he could write a whole book like Bill. And Bill said, why, it's a cinch, you know. Mr. Ackman then took the two chapters into Mr. Canfield's office. Another meeting was held, and the result was that Harper's intimated that they would pay Bill as a budding author $1,500 in advance royalty, bringing in enough money for Bill to finish the book. Now, at first, Bill felt very elated about it, but then after a while, not so good about it because Bill began to reason, and so did the other boys. Well, if this guy Wilson eats up to 1500 bucks while he's doing the book, and after the book gets out, it will take a long time to catch up. And if this thing gets all the publicity that we believe it may get, what are we going to do about inquiries? And after all, what's a lousy 10% raw anyway? Then they thought, too, that even though Harper's was a fine publisher, if this book, if and when done, should prove to be the main textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous, why would we want our main means of propagation in the hands of strangers or someone else? Why shouldn't we control it? Well, at this book, the book project really began to take off, and thank God that decision was made. Why what we ought to do, they thought, is to form a book company, a publishing company, an incorporation. We'll call it Works Publishing Company, this being the first of great many works. And then they could sell stock certificates to all the drunks and get some money coming in to support the author and the guy who was collecting the money and the gal who was helping as a secretary on the book. So they took this idea to the next trustees' meeting, and the trustees all shook their head and said, No. Well, they had an alcoholic rebellion, and they told those non-alcoholic friends, well, after all, you haven't produced any money, and we think we're going to try this thing on separate from the foundation. So Bill had a drunk helping him on this thing, one super promoter by the name of Hank Parkhurst. And Hank used to be, when he was in his not in his cup, he used to be the public relations director for Standard Oil of New Jersey. And he said, Bill... This is simple. Come with me. They went out and walked into a stationery store, and they bought a pad of blank stock certificates, and they just wrote across the top of these blank stock certificates, Works Publishing Company, par value $25. Then they took a pad of these stock certificates, which were worthless at the time. Of course, they didn't bother to incorporate it, and that didn't happen for several years later to the next AA meeting where we're not supposed to mix money with spirituality and say the drunks, look here, this thing is going to be a cinch. Parkhurst will take a third of this for services rendered. I, Bill, the author, will take a third for my services rendered. And you drunks can have a third of these stock certificates, par $25. 
if you'll just start paying up on your stock. And if you only want one share, five dollars a month for five months. And all the drunks gave Bill and Hank that cold look. They said, what the heck? You mean to say that you're asking us to buy stock in a book that you haven't even written yet? Why, well, sure, they said. If Harper's will put money in this thing, why shouldn't you? They say it's going to be a good buck, but the drunk said, no deal. So Hank and Bill searched and started a new pitch at the drunks. They told them that they'd been looking at the printing cost of the book. He said, we got a book here that's going to be between 400 and 450 pages. And they found out from printers what it would cost. And it ought to be uh, sell it for $3.50. Now, back in those days, they found on inquiry from printers that a book that sold for $3.50 could be printed for $0.35, therefore making a 1,000% profit. Of course, they didn't mention to the drunks the other expenses. So just think, boys, when these books move out in carload lots, we're printing them for $0.35, we're going to sell them for $3.50 by direct mail, how could you lose? And the drunks still said, heck no. So Hank and Bill figured that they had to have a better argument than that. How are we going to convince the drunks that we will move these books out in carload lots? Millions and millions of dollars. So they get the idea to go up to Reader's Digest, and they get an appointment with Mr. Payne, the managing editor. Now, the way they got that, that appointment with Mr. Payne, Dr. Silkworth was renting a house from Mr. Williams, and Mr. Williams was the owner of Reader's Digest. And every month when Dr. Silkworth was sending his rent check, he'd send it to Mr. Walters, who was the comptroller of Reader's Digest. And the drunks conned him into sending snatches of the introduction to the book and Dr. Silkworth's opinion and Bill's story and maybe get it to the attention of Mr. Williams. And that's how they got the in at Reader's Digest. And so they went to Mr. Uh, to him and excitedly told him the exciting story of the budding society. They dwelled on their friendship of Mr. John D. Rockefeller, Jr. and all of Mr. Rockefeller's friends. They dwelled on Henry, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick and that the society was out to, about to publish a textbook. Would this need not be a matter of tremendous interest to the Reader's Digest? Of course, the drunks were thinking about Reader's Digest circulation at that time with about 12 million readers. And if they could just only get a free plug, a free ad, it would really move their book. Mr. Payne liked the idea. And he asked Bill when the project book would be finished, and he would take the matter up with his editorial board. And when the time is right, he said, you get the book all ready to shoot, come on up, we'll put a special feature writer on this thing, Well, this is all that Bill and Hank needed to hear. So they went back to the drunks and said, Now look, boys, there's positively now millions of dollars in this thing for us. How can we miss? And after all, we only need four or five thousand bucks. So they began to sell shares in works publishing, not yet incorporated, five dollars a month to poor people. One guy bought ten shares. They sold a few shares to non-alcoholic And Hank, who was very important in this deal, because he's the one that went out and kept strong-arming and collecting the money. So Bill and Ruthie Hawk, the secretary, could work on the book. And Lloyd was, Lois would have some groceries. And all Lois was still working. Lois, in an apartment store. Lois didn't take a chance. She knew that she's the only one that was bringing in any money. And she knew if she didn't work, nobody would have any money. So the foundation started. Some more chapters were written. And they went to AA meetings in New York with these chapters in the rough, and the drunks start chewing the chapters apart. And Bill suddenly found himself in the middle of a whirlpool of argument. And Bill came just the umpire, and he said, Look, boys, over oh, here you've got the holy rollers who say we need all of that good old-fashioned stuff in this book. And over here you say we've got to have a psychological book. And that never cured anybody. And they didn't do much with the drunks down in the missions. So I guess you'll have to leave it to me to be the umpire. I'll scribble out some things here. Let's get the comments in. 
So they fought, bled, and died through one chapter of another. And what they would do every time they'd write a page or a chapter, they'd leave four blank spaces under each line. they send them out to Akron, let the Akron bunch look at it, make their comments, and send it back and approval. And once again, terrific hassles developed on what should go in the book. Meanwhile, drunks were set writing their stories. And then came the night when they got to chapter 5. Because here is the point in the book where the book had to say what this thing is all about and how this deal worked. As I said, it was originally a six-step program. And one night Bill was laying in bed trying to think of what this chapter 5 would be all about. Then the idea came to Bill that they need a definite statement, concrete principles that these drunks could not wiggle out of. There cannot be any wiggling out of this deal at all. And the six-step program had two big holes in it. Moreover, if this book goes out to distant readers, they have to have an exact, explicit program by which to go by. And while Bill was thinking these things over, and while he was mad at the dickens at these drunks because the money was coming in slow, there was a, his doorbell rang, and Bill went to the door, and there was a member of Alcoholics and I brought a brand new one in there to meet Bill. And he said, what are you doing? Bill said, I'm busy working on my book. And they had a terrific argument. And Bill run them off. And he went back to his bed. There was a pad a paper and a pencil lay, and he said to himself, I have to break this thing up into small pieces. And he started writing, trying to bust it up in little pieces. And when he got the pieces set down, he put numbers on them and was agreeably surprised when it came out at 12. And then he noticed where he filled the holes in the six-step program, that instead of leaving the God idea until last, he put it up in front. And that is as we now know as our third step. And the second hole that he plugged, he plugged the glue and the anchor of our recovery program, and that's step six and seven. Well, he didn't pay much to attention to that, and he thought it looked pretty good. By the time the next meeting came along, Bill had gone beyond the steps, trying to amplify them and the rest of that chapter. But when he took those steps in that chapter in the meeting, all heck broke loose. And the drunk started screaming, what do you mean by changing our program? What about this and what about that? This thing is overloaded with God. We don't like this. You got those drunks down on their knees. Stand them up. A lot of these drunks are scared of being God bit. Let's take God out of it entirely. And such were the arguments they had. But out of this terrific hassle about the 12 steps, there did come a 10 strike. That argument caused the introduction of the phrase in our step, which has been a lifesaver for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousand alcoholics and millions yet to come, which by Bill's own words, something not of his doing, because Bill was on the pie side then, still suffering from his big hot flash. But the idea, God as you understand him, came out of that perfectly ferocious argument, and that was put in the steps, and little by little, The book ground down. Little by little, the drunks put in the money. An office was kept open in Newark. The money ran low at times. And and little Ruthie Hawk worked with no pay. But when she said she needed some money, they went and got a pad of blank stock certificate, wrote card $25 on it, and gave it to her and said, Here, here's another week's pay. January 1939, when somebody said, well, why don't we try this thing out with a pre-publication copy, a monolithic or mimeograph copy of this text and a few of the stories, try it out on the doctors, the preachers, the Catholic Committee on Publication, psychiatrists, policemen, fishwives, housewives, drunks, everybody, just to see if we have anything that goes against the grain, any place, and also see if we can get some better ideas. At considerable expense, a pre-publication copy was made. Comments came back, many very helpful. And then he went to the Catholic Committee on Publication in New York. And at that time, they only had one member who in the group who happened to be of the Catholic faith to take it there. And he had just gotten out of the insane asylum. 
and had nothing to do with the preparation of the book, and to the great surprise, it was well received, and they were impressed. Now, if you would like to see a copy of that Mulcalith copy, over there in the corner, Ray has got one of the most fabulous, and it's not all of it, just some of it, from our archives. And they have a copy of the Mulcalith copy, also at the tape table. Uh, Lee has some. And it's very, very interesting if you look at it and read it, and particularly read after the ABCs, where it says, if you're not satisfied with this book, then throw the book away. Yeah, that's exactly what it says. And so the book passed mustard. Somehow the stories came in. Somehow the galleys were written together. Then they got up to the printing contract, but the drunks weren't paying up. So Bill went up to see Colonel Towns, and the colonel who believed might in the drunks, and Bill put the slug on him for $2,500. But Dr. Ta uh, uh, Colonel Towns didn't want any of that stock. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You give me a promissory note on the book not yet written. And the $2,500 was rooted around the Alcoholic Foundation, so it would be tax-exempt. In those six months with the office and supporting these people, they had blown $6,000, and the till was getting mighty low again. Still, none of the drunks were working. They didn't go back to work, and they still had to get it printed. Well, they went up to Cornwall Press at that time, was the largest printer of books in the world, and they asked about printing. And the Cornwall Press said they'd glad to do it. And then they asked, well, how many books they wanted? Well, they gave them the same old pitch about having a small membership, but the Reader's Digest was going to write an article about the book, and it was hard to estimate how many they needed. But they assured the printer that they would go out and carload lots. Now, the printer was none other than Mr. Blackwell, who also became one of our great friends. Then Mr. Blackwell said, Well, boys, how much of a down payment are you going to make? And how many books would you like? So they told him, well, let's print 5000 to start with. Then Mr. Blackwell said, well, what are you going to use for money? And he was told, well, not very much, maybe a few hundred dollars on account. But remember, Mr. Blackwell, we're traveling with the Rockefellers, and we're traveling with all their friends and good company. So Mr. Blackwell started printing the first 5,000 books of the first printing of the Book of Alcoholics, not Big Red, 10 cents down per book. Then all of a sudden, Hank and Bill thought about Reader's Digest. So they went up to the Reader's Digest, and Mr. Payne, and they were, they said to Mr. Payne, we're ready to shoot. And Mr. Payne said, shoot what? And then he said, oh yes, I remember you, Mr. Parkhurst and Mr. Wilson, when you were up here last fall. I told you that the Reader's Digest would be interested in this new work and in this new book. But right after you were here, I consulted with the editorial board, and much to my great surprise, they did not like the idea at all that the book was too controversial, and I simply forgot to tell you. Well, Hank and Bill had the drunks with four or five thousand in it. Colonel Towns hooked for twenty five hundred bucks, and on the cuff was a printer, and maybe five hundred dollars left in the bank. What are they going to do now? Morgan Ryan, who had taken the book over to the Catholic Foundation, had at one time been a terrific advertising genius. And he said, look, some of you in here may be old enough to remember this. I know Gabriel Heater, and Gabriel Heater is putting on those three-minute health programs on the radio. And I'll get an interview with Gabriel Heater. So their spirits rose once again. And then all of a sudden, they had a big chill. Supposing this Irishman got drunk before Heater interviewed him. Meanwhile, Heater agreed to interview Morgan, and then the drunks got still more scared. So they rented a room in the down New York Downtown Athletic Club, and they put Morgan in there with a day and night guard for ten days. Meanwhile, their spirits were rising. The drunk could see these books just flooding the country. Then Hank said, What well, we need to follow up on this Heater thing, to be heard all over the country, and I think the big market for this book 
or the physicians and doctors, and I suggest that we uh, pitch in the last 500 bu bucks that we got in the bank on a postal card shower, shower going to every physician east of the Mississippi River. Postal card, we will say, hear all about Alcoholics Anonymous on Gabriel's Heater's program. Send $3.50 for the book Alcoholics Anonymous, Sure Cure for Alcoholism. This was done. They managed to keep Morgan sober. All the drunks had their ears glued to the radio. But the AA market was already had been saturated. For they had 49 stockholders, and they got a book for nothing. And then everybody with a store in the book got one for free. And so the AA market had been exhausted. There's nobody left in AA to buy a book. But they could envision these doctors and their patients buying these books by carload lots. Morgan is interviewed. Heater pulls out all the stops. And the drunks couldn't wait to go down to the old post office box, 658 Church Street Annex, the address printed in the back of, of the first printing of the Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They hung to it for about three days. And then Hank, Ruth, and Bill went over, and they looked in box 658. And it wasn't a lock box. It was just eyes and glad you looked through. And you had to go to the clerk to get your mail. And they looked in there and they could see a few of these postal cards. And Bill had a terrific sinking spell. But Hank, the promoter, said, Why, Bill, they can't put all of those orders in that little bitty box. They got mail bags full back there. Let's go get our mail. So they went to the clerk and they asked him for the mail. And he brings out 12 lousy postal cards, 10 of them completely illegible, written by doctors drunk as monkeys, and they had exactly two orders for the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and they were absolutely and utterly, totally broke. The sheriff then moved in on the office, and poor Mr. Blackwell wondered what to do for money about the books and felt like taking the book over. And at that very opportune moment, the house in which the Wilsons were living in was foreclosed, and the Wilson and their furniture were set out on the street. And that was the state of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in the summer of 1939. Then the drunks started screaming, Where and where is our $4,500? Colonel Towns became uneasy. What are they going to do now? Then they began to shop around from one magazine to another. Nobody bit. And it looked like the whole thing was going down the drain. However, one of the boys in New York City who was a little prosperous at the time, in the clothing business by the name of Bert Taylor saved him. Bill went to see him and told him that there was a promise of an article in the Liberty magazine, but it wouldn't come out until next September to be called Alcoholics and God, to be written by Morris Markley, and to be printed by Fulton Alser, who was then the religious editor. And we need a thousand dollars to keep get us through the summer. Bert says, I do not have the money, but I have a friend down in Baltimore, Mr. Cochran. He's connected with the wet and dry forces. Bill said, now, wait a minute about this wet and dry business. Bert said, heck, Bill, you're not going to be fussy where you're going to get this money and this thousand. We're all busted. He's a customer of mine. I sell him pants. Let's call him up. So Bert gets on the phone, and he tells Mr. Cochran, you know, from time to time, I have mentioned to you about this alcoholic fellowship, which I belong to, and Mr. Cochran. Our fellowship has just come out with a magnificent new textbook, Sure Cure for Alcoholism. And it's something that we believe that every public library in the country should have. And the retail price of the book is $3.50. But if you will buy a couple of thousand and put them in every large public library, of course, we would sell the book to you for that purpose at a considerable discount. Mr. Cochran didn't buy that deal. So then Bert told him that some publicity about this book will come out next fall. But in the meantime, he said, we desperately need $1,000 to tide us over the summer. Would you loan the Works Publishing Company $1,000? Well, Mr. Cochran said, well, what does this Works Publishing Company's balance sheet look like? And when he was told, he said, no, thank you. And then Bert asked, well, would you loan the money to me on the credit of my business? Well, sure, said Mr. Cocker. 
just send down your note and sign it and have it notarized. So Bert hocked his business. A year or two later, it was to go broke anyway. That saved the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And that lasted until the Liberty article came in. 800 inquiries came in as a result of that article. They moved a few books, barely squeaked through the year 1939, but all this time nothing had been heard from John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Meanwhile, foundation meeting after foundation meeting, too bad, boys, you're having such a hard time, but we are not going to raise any money for you, and we're not going to give you any money. Thank God they didn't. They forced the drunks to write this magnificent recovery program that we got. Too bad you're having a hard time, but no money. When all of a sudden, about February 1940, Mr. Richardson came to a trustees meeting and announced that Mr. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., whom nothing had been heard from since 1937, had been watching all this time with immense interest. And he's making a lot of inquiries. Moreover, he said, Mr. Rockefeller would like to give this fellowship a dinner to which he will invite his friends to see the beginning of this new and promising start. And then Mr. Richardson produced the invitation list. And every chairman of the board of every outstanding corporation in the, in the East, chairman and president of banks, insurance companies, names like Wendell Wilkie, John Foster Dulles, the Austin Slosses, you just name it, everybody, in, uh, old man Kresge, all of them, Started the dime store business. All of them, from all over, from Boston, the Cabots and the Lodges and all those people. And, and, and all kinds of prominent people. And mainly they were extremely rich. And Bill looked at that list and Bill figured, my God, there's a couple of billion dollars in this deal. This is going to be slim, going to be good picking, you know. The dinner came and they got Harry Emerson Fosdick to review the AA book. He gave a wonderful plug. Foster Kennedy came and spoke of the medical attitude as they'd seen a very hopeless gal by the name of Marty Mann recover, who was one of his patients. Bill got up and talked about life among the anonymi, and the bankers, 75 strong, sat at tables that were interspersed with the drunks. And, well, the bankers had come really as a sort of command performance, and they were a little suspicious. And perhaps this is another one of... Rockefeller's prohibition deals. But they warmed up under the influence and the chatter of the alcoholics. Morgan Ryan was asked at his table by a very prominent and distinguished banker. Why, Mr. Ryan, we presume that you are in the banking business. No, Mr. Ryan said, not at all. I'm just fresh out of the Greystone Insane Asylum. But unfortunately, Mr. John D. Rockefeller Jr. could not get to the dinner. He was quite ill. And so he sent, sent his son, a wonderful man, Nelson Rockefeller, in his place instead. And after the show was over with, and the drunks were ready to put the big touch on all these rich people, Nelson Rockefeller got up and, speaking for his father, said, My father stand, sends word that he is so sorry that he cannot be here tonight, but so glad that so many of his friends can be here and see this beginning of this great and wonderful thing, something Nelson Rockefeller said that has affected his father's life more than anything else. A stupendous plug that was. Then said Nelson, but fortunately, gentlemen, this is the work that proceeds on goodwill. It requires no money. Whereupon the two billion bucks got up and walked out. Again, the hand of providence intervene right after the dinner. Rockefeller, Jr. asked that the talks be published in a pamphlet. He approached a rather defunct works publishing company and said he would like to buy 400 books to send to all of his banker friends and others who had come to the dinner and all who had not. Seeing that this was for a good purpose, they let him have the books cheap. He bought them cheaper than anybody else has bought the books. They sold 400 books to John Jr. for one dollar apiece. And with this book and pamphlets, he sent a personally hand-signed written letter to every one of them. And in this letter, he again recited how glad he was 
that his friends had been so able to see this great beginning of what he thought would be a wonderful thing, how deeply it affected him. And then he said, this fortune is a work of goodwill. It sees little, if any, money, perhaps a slight amount of temporary help. I'm giving these good people $1,000. So when the bankers received Mr. Rockefeller's Letter, they all added it up on the cuff. Well, if John D. Jr., who's a billionaire, is only giving a thousand, and me, I'm only worth two hundred million, I'm just gonna give him ten bucks. One who had an alcoholic relative sent in three hundred dollars. John Foster Dulles sent in ten bucks. So all told, as a result of that dinner, they got together three thousand dollars, which was the first outside contribution to the Alcoholic Foundation. That money was divided equally between Bill and Dr. Bob, so they could be going, keep going somehow. And they solicited that dinner list for five years, at the average of about $3,000 a year. And at the end of five years, they said at that time they were able to say to Mr. Rockefeller, thank you, we don't need any more of your money or your friend's money. The book income is helping to support our office. The groups are contributing to fill in. The royalties from the book are taking care of Dr. Bob and Bill. Thank you, but we don't need any more outside money. Now, maybe you can see that Mr. Rockefeller's decision not to give us money literally, literally saved this society. He gave of himself at the time when he was under public ridicule for his views about alcohol. He said to the whole world, this thing is good. The story went out on the news wires all over the world. People ran into the bookstores to get the new book. An awful lot of inquiries came into that little office on Deasy Street. The book money began to pay for an additional office helper. And then comes Jack Alexander with his terrific article in the Saturday Evening Post. And if you'd like to see what that looks like, although it's under plexiglass, Ray also has it in those archives. And it came out in March of 1900 and 41 in the Saturday Evening Post, the article by Jack Alexander. And with this terrific article in the Saturday Post, as a result came an immense flood of inquiries, six or seven thousand, and Alcoholics Anonymous become a national institution. Such is the story of the preparation of the book Alcoholics Anonymous and of its subsequent effect, whom all of us here in this meeting have some notion. Now, the proceeds from that book have repeatedly saved the office in New York. It still saves our office in New York. But it isn't the money that came out of it that matters. It is the message that this book carries in it that has transcended the mountains and the seas, and it even at this moment lighting candles in dark caverns and in distant lands. And now I'm going to read a portion of a letter to you. It is absolutely exciting. Its letter was written to Bill by Hank Parkhurst. Dear Bill, I am rushing off to you excerpts from a letter just received from Mr. Thomas H. Uzel, former editor of Collier's Magazine, writer of several books, contributor to Collier's Saturday Evening Post, etc. As you know, hardly a year goes past when one of Mr. Uzel's writings do not appear on the bestseller list. Incidentally, this might be interesting to you. Such books as The Good Earth, If I Had Four Apples, The Outward Room, Three Books of the, uh, Three Book of the Month Club books, and bestsellers for months and years after publishing, were submitted to him for criticism and final designing. In the publishing and literature world, literary world, I know there is no one who is so well established and looked up to as Mr. Uzel. I have gone into considerable length in regard to this, because the following portion of this letter has made me so, so enthusiastic. Mr. Yu says, quote, I spent last evening with the manuscript. I knew, of course, what the document was. But on reading additional chapters and surveying the job as a whole, I found myself deeply moved at times, full of amazement, almost incredibly and during most of the reading, I was extremely sympathetic. My feeling at the moment is that you should certainly hold on to the production and distribution of this volume, if you can, 
for she ought to go far, wide, and handsome, and let those a considerable and neat profit. You have here an unusual book. You have an extremely urgent problem. You have a successful defiance of medicine. You have a religious story. You have a deeply human story. And lastly, you have a whole flock of happy endings. My God, I don't know what else you could want for a good book. I believe in it most emphatically. The whole book needs the final shaping of professional hand. And I'll stop here just a minute. They paid that gentleman $800 to whip the book into shape as we now know it. But it is in what is interesting that he ends his letter as follows. I understand better now the enthusiasm you revealed in your talks with me about this work. I thought you were exaggerating somewhat. But now I have joined the core invisible. Bill, if I were you, Hank writes, I would be intensely proud of this opinion. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for your attendance. And let's have about a 15-minute break, and we can start again at 3.30 with smoking time. And also buy raffle tickets. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about the nuts and bolts of Alcoholics and our sponsorship. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.